those who are, will be joining us live, we appreciate that. For those who are watching this um, as a recording, we thank you for doing that as well. My name is Rabia Lewis. I'm with my father, Dr. Charles S. Finch. Um, tonight, we will be talking about Imhotep and the African background to science. Also, just we'd like to tell everybody that in the year 2020, I know that sounds like a long time away, but it's actually two years. In, in two years, um, the summer of 2020, my dad will be taking his last trip to Africa and he's gonna be going to Egypt. So if that's something you'd be interested in going with him to Egypt, just keep that in mind. Start making your preparations for that. Um, again, I'll pretty much turn it over to him and let him do or talk on his expertise on, um, oh, he has his books laid, a few of his books laid out that relate to the topic of tonight. Now, again, this is only going to be more of like a 30 minute uh, just talk. He can get real in depth on something. Sometimes we go over, but we try to keep it short just for Facebook. But here, I'm going to grab some of his books that he does have. I don't know if some of you might have be familiar with them, but some of you may not. Uh, the African Background to Medical Science, one of the first books Dr. Finch ever wrote back in the 80s. I don't know if you can see that. You know, on my screen it's flipped, but hopefully it's not for you guys. So that's primarily, he'll be speaking um, on some of the uh, things he's discussed in this book, but he wrote that so long ago, some people haven't even, <laughs> some people haven't even, aren't even familiar with it anymore. This was a more recent book. I think it was, you wrote in the 90s, right? Late, late 1998 is when it was published. Uh, again, The Star of Deep Beginnings. Genesis of African Science and Technology. Yes. The Star of Deep Beginnings, Genesis of African Science and Technology. See, there's just a few of the books. Just in case you're interested in more reading, um, you know, you can just listen on or you can, you know, do more research in the future. There's also another book. He didn't write this one, but it's called Imhotep by... Hurry, just yeah, says hurry. hurry. We want more information on we'll what he's going to be talking minute, about yeah. tonight. Um, so he's he's a, a great scholar on African um, African science and pretty much in religion, spirituality, especially as it pertains to ancient Egypt or the Nile Valley um, in that um, in that era. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Charles Finch. Thank you. Again, I just have to make the point that, uh, as I have on previous occasions, uh, this whole, what do you want to call it? Oh, yeah, these, these Facebook Live sessions are the product of the inspiration and um, initiative of my daughter sitting with me, uh, Rabia Finch Lewis. As I, I said before, I'll say it again, uh, mother of four of my grandchildren. And um, so, yeah, she uh, has a very varied kind of life. But without, we can kind of plunge into our subject, Imhotep, um, and it, it's a vast subject. <laughs> 30 minutes, we're only gonna touch on the highlights, all right? Um, Hurry, who you mentioned, let me see that book again, please, Rabia. This is sort of the, uh, I don't know if you can see it, J.S. J. S. Hurry. And this is a monograph, that is to say, written about Imhotep and everything that was known about him, first published in 1928. Um, he mentioned what Sir William Osler said in the early uh, 20th century. Sir, Sir William Osler was actually a Canadian who worked out of Johns Hopkins and was one of the most famous physicians of his era. Uh, but he was learned too. And what he said about Imhotep is that Imhotep was the first figure of a physician to stand out clearly from the mists of antiquity. Now, Imhotep, uh, I call him the first universal genius of whom we have any knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, Imhotep was a physician, a transcendently gifted physician, architect having designed and built the first great edifice in stone known to human, by human hand, known to human history, the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, which still stands in, in Kemet or ancient Egypt. He was also an astronomer, a philosopher, and yes, he was a magician. I don't know if we're going to touch too much on the magician part of it simply because of time, but you could see that the word Renaissance man, if you call it that, would originated with a man such as Imhotep. Right? So um, 
as I say, he was uh, the first universal genius of whom we have any knowledge. He uh, was prime minister under Joseir in the third dynasty. So Imhotep would have lived about 3800 BC. So what, how long was that? That's nearly seven, right? 6,000 years ago, a little more. Um, 3,800. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was prime minister. On top of all these other accomplishments, he was prime minister under Joseir. Uh, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of my story, but that's how it is. In, in about 3,000 years later, yeah, it's about that, a little longer, his reputation had, had hmm, what do I want to say, bloomed and blossomed to such a great extent, not only in Kemet, but throughout that part of the world, that he was deified as a physician. Mm -hmm. He became a god of medicine in Kemet. And in Greece. Uh, Greece, too. That's, mm -hmm. that, thank you for reminding me, Rabia. Mm -hmm. Asclepios, who was the Greek god of medicine, who was identified with Imhotep. So when the, the Greeks use that name interchangeably, Imhotep and Asclepios. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see, you know, uh, his, his, what do you want to call it, his reputation, his renown just grew, if, you can, if that was even possible, uh, in the years after the Third Dynasty, because he was lived during the Third Dynasty. Uh, as I say, fair, uh, 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 prime minister under the Pharaoh Joseir. Right. But um, he was from a family of architects and uh, prime ministers. All right. And um, he exerted a tremendous influence on the subsequent history of Kemet, of Egypt. He was, as I say, he was not only a architect, a physician, a physician of genius. In fact, everything he touched, we touched with genius. Uh, so much so that the Greeks, as I've already mentioned, worshipped him. But he was an architect of genius, as we have already mentioned. He was an astronomer. He was a philosopher. And yes, he was what people would call a magician. That is, had the capacity to, how can we put this, know, see, and control the invisible forces of nature and the universe. So, um, Imhotep uh, was a very, he's beyond fascinating. And you can see why, with all of this all of these capabilities that he had, why he would eventually become a, a, a deity of medicine and worshipped as such. In fact, there are temples even now that you can visit in Kemet or in Egypt which are dedicated to him, because right? he was worshipped. Uh, and he was considered the son of Ptah. Ptah. Ptah great was the yeah, great architect, that's yeah. right. Great architect, the opener. Uh, and so he uh, lived at a time when Ptah was the supreme deity of ancient Kemet, and he was considered the son of Ptah, right? And uh, so, when, and later, in later years, you know, Egyptian deities, pantheons, always came in, tri in three, trilogies or trinities, if you will. Um, and uh, Imhotep was the third part of the trinity or trilogy of Ptah. Oh, I forget who and his wife. I'm sorry. <laughs> that happens. I start, I start blocking uh, on things I shouldn't be blocking on. Any case, so um, uh, he was directly connected to Ptah. All right. So in a sense, he was the <laughs> progenitor of what we think of as science in Kemet. Now, I have to really be careful. Uh, I, I need to define this word science because what's happened in the last 500 years, the word science has taken on a meaning that it didn't start out with. Science comes from the Latin word scientia, which means simply to know. It was simply knowledge as such. It wasn't just empirical knowledge that was created, shall we say, by, quote, research, experimentation, all of that. It was knowledge in the fullest sense of the word, okay? Um, and if you use it in that way, then you, you have a better idea of, the, of, of what Imhotep and others uh, like him, I say others, other great uh, men and intellects in ancient Kemet, you know, represented. Because he wasn't the only one. He's just sort of the most famous one. But there were others who were almost equally revered in ancient Kemet. Now, someone put Sekhmet. That wasn't the wife, was it? Actually, I think it was, yes. Sekhmet. She's right. Whoever, uh, yeah, there are, uh, we, our, our, our uh, audience sometimes yeah. supplies me with missing pieces <laughs> of information. And I do appreciate it. We do appreciate it. So you can keep doing that when you, when I have a, a blank spot in, in some moment. of the things. Yeah, senior <laughs> moment. I hate to admit that I have senior moments, but I do. Anyway, um, so he was the, um, the, you could say, the progenitor of science. Because we could also talk about astronomy. Now, you've got to understand, astronomy in ancient Kemet was not just looking up at the sky and looking up at the stars. 
the, ooh, you just can't imagine the kind of precision and the details they went to to plot the movement of the heavenly bodies. All right? If you look, if you go, if you ever go, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm talking too fast, sorry. The Great Pyramid, and we don't have time to talk about the Great Pyramid, unfortunately. Maybe that will be a webinar, I don't know. Um, but if you could take off the, the top half of the Great Pyramid, the ascending passage actually uh, points to the northern hemisphere. And if you could just sit there and watch, you would see all the stars going across that aperture in such a way that they could create a heavenly meridian. Now, if you can create a heavenly meridian, you can create an earthly meridian. What's a meridian? A longitude. That means the ancient Egyptians not only knew heavenly longitude, they knew earthly longitude. That meant, means they knew that the earth was round. And they knew the dimensions of the earth. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> this is, and, and they built it into the Great Pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you could imagine that. All right? And the Great Pyramid actually was, the Great Pyramid actually was built after yeah. the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, that uh, was designed and built by mm -hmm. Imhotep. You see, I've been to Kemet, let's see, 11, 12 times. My friend, Anthony Karakamoon Browder, I call him Karakamoon, I don't have time to explain why, has been there 52 times, because oh. he, he's also doing um, excavations there. The first and only black man to do that in Egypt. Can't talk about that too much now, but the point is, he's been 52 times. And when you go to Kemet, go to Egypt, it pulls you back again and again, all right? The fascination. Anyway, I'm kind of getting off a little bit off my subject, but the point is, it also applies to astronomy and the movement of the heavenly bodies and the calendar. People think a calendar is just somewhere, something that you plot dates on. You look at the calendar, oh, today is what? June, what is it? June? July. July, July sorry. 10th. <laughs> July 10th, 2018. Daughter's birthday. All right. Yeah, my, I have another daughter here. It is her birthday. <laughs> so <laughs> we're, we're turning this into a family event. Anyway, um, but calendars are not just calendars. They require intricate and precise astronomical knowledge and observation. And the first one is to do that systematically and precisely where, we're, this is what I'm saying, the people of Kemet, all right? Now, they had more than one calendar. They had the calendar based on the, the so-called heliacal rising of Sirius. That is the, that is the uh, excuse me, that is the, uh, not the planet, the star Sirius rising right before the sun uh, at the spring equinox. And that's a cycle that's 4,286 uh, years long. Then there's a, a cycle of the, equ uh, of the uh, precession. I think I mentioned that before, but let's mention it again. A 26,000 year cycle called the Great Year. <laughs> Started in Africa. That, that plots the um, passing of the zodiac. Yes, the... yeah. For example, <laughs> the so called zodiac, the, the okay, uh, the uh, axis of the Earth, well, there's the vertical axis, then there's the magnetic axis caused by the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon. And because of that, the Earth's axis tilts at 23 and a half degrees. And that means when, it, but it, that means that the Earth has to wobble. And it wobbles around the vertical axis every 26,000 years. The ancient people of Kemet knew that and they created a year and a calendar around that. We're in it right now. And um, so <laughs> that's a, so what, the, what people call the so-called zodiac which came down, of course, from Kemet. And we are, we will, in 21 years, we will be halfway through this cycle of the great year, of this great year. The great year that we're in started almost 13,000 years ago. And it's tracked through what people call the signs of the zodiac. And the next sign that's coming, that's going to rise right before the sun at the spring equinox is going to be the so-called sign of Aquarius. We're in the sign of Pisces now, and so we're in the age of Pisces, but the age of Pisces is going to fade, and the age of Aquarius is coming into play. Now, Aquarius, people call him the water man, didn't start out that way. In Kemet, uh, 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 Aquarius was uh, the great mother of the waters. Now, in late times, in Greek times, they made him Hapi, which was the Nile god. 
But if you look at Hapi in the Egyptian uh, the zodiac, he has a breast, <laughs> which indicates his origins. All right. So Aquarius is the age of the great mother of the waters, and that will last 2,160 years. Mm -hmm. Just like Pisces started 119 B.C. And, and Pisces was what? Fish. Wait a minute. Wait, yeah, 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 she's doing my lecture for me. <laughs> she's stealing my thunder. That's okay. I sorry, like it. I love it. No, no. I, I like her to do that. You know, I really do. And um, so she can keep doing that. Two fishes, though. Now, come on, people. Double fish, two fishes. What, what are we talking about? The age of what? The, the two fishes and the loaves. The age of Christianity. is a Piscean age. The other people who, who, who follow the, the Piscean age very closely are the Dogon because they the, the represent their deities are fish beings. And then we're moving now, but we're moving out of that one after nearly 2,160 years or so, give or take two years or so, into the age of so-called Aquarius, which is the age of the great mother of the waters. And when does that happen? Uh, 2039. Oh, 2039. Or thereabouts. Wow. That's right. So, those of you who have a Daddy. Yoruba perspective, that's Yemanya. Well, it's Eyamanya Oshun, I guess. It's mother and daughter fused together. Those of you who have a, uh, a Vodun perspective, it's Mamiwata. Uh, if you're going back to Kemet, it's Hathor Isis or Hathor Newt. Uh, you know, because, you know, in ancient Kemet, the deities would often be fused and combined together in a single composite, seamless unity. Anyway, <laughs> but, <laughs> and I, I, you know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going far afield. But all this does, believe it or not, really relate to Imhotep because Imhotep and the sages of ancient Kemet put all this together. Mm. All right? Because right after that, there is another cycle that's 26,000 years. It's the pole stars. And there's seven of them. And so it takes 3,700 years for each pole star to come into the North Pole. Right now, what we call at the North Pole is the little bear, but in ancient times it was a jackal, Anubis, Saab. Saab was a judge. Why? Why would the jackal be the judge? Because the jackal has ears, long pointed ears. And what does the judge do? The judge listens. At that age, though, it's coming to an end uh, 11 years later, 2039, 2050. What is, oh, what is coming into place? I don't know that one. <laughs> what is coming into place? The age of Kepheus. Oh, goodness. And who is Kepheus? Kepheus was the co ancient cosmic Ethiopian king. So for 3,700 years, the world and the cosmos will be, wrought, will be ruled by the cosmic Ethiopian king, beginning in 2050. I won't live to see it, unfortunately, but maybe my children and grandchildren will. <laughs> I'm 70 years old. I ain't proud, ain't, ain't too ashamed, ain't too proud to say it. And, uh, but, you see, this is the thing. Through Imhotep, the astronomer, the ast astronomer slash astrologer, and the other great sages, they were able to track cosmic history heavenly history and earthly history through a deep and precise knowledge of the movement and the activities of the heavens. You see, there's this connection between heaven and earth that most of us have no, no conception of. In ancient Kemet, it was just, uh, it, was, it was known and given a sense that what happened on, as above, so below. The earth, the, the, the movements, like there's a whole history in, in the heavens. There's a history in the heavens, and that history here is really conditioned by what happens in the heavens. That's sort of what the zodiac is about, by the way. Now, somebody mentioned the emerald tablets, and is that real? Yeah, but you know, um, I know I'm it has something to do with. Um, yeah, no, I've heard of the emerald tablets, but I don't. The, the Kabbalah and the yeah. Masons. Yeah, and you see it, but all of that. Solomon. All of that, the, every last one of King them. King Solomon. All of that. Solomon was what? He was the builder. Yeah, and the temple he, he, he was built a mason. in Jerusalem. Yes, and, and, and somebody said that the Temple of Solomon, who has said that? I'll remember in a minute, was built on the ground plans of an Egyptian temple. Mm. In fact, Solomon's name, if you break it down into its Hebrew components, mean, it kind of means mason. 
or a uh, you know constructor. So the Masons have their roots. Yeah, well, yeah, they, yeah, <laughs> duh, yeah, they do, and they claim Masons. Egypt for themselves. The the, the 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 Masons, the Freemasons, without real sense that these were Black African people. Oh, I know. I think they were called the Tablets of Destiny, the Tables of Destiny. They could have been. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry. That's just not something I'm. But you know, in this way, my I'm learning from my daughter, speaking about it right now, uh, or at least I'm being reminded by her and it has about to do that. With, um, um, I'm trying to think of his name. Hmm. I'm blocking. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, uh, all of this. Um, so we, see, um, I haven't even been able to get into African science. I haven't even been able to get into I mathematics. Know. Okay. I, oh, I will say this. Because I'm, otherwise I'll forget it and we'll finish before I'm able to come out with it. Kemet means the black land. Okay? Well, then there was something called the science or the art of Kemet. And the Greeks and later Arabs called it alchemy. Mm -hmm. mm. Alchemy. Which then becomes chemistry. So the word chemistry has its root in the ancient names of Egypt, which was Kemet, or the Black Land. Oh, gosh. Afraid so. The art, in fact, because just like so many other things, the people of Kemet or Egypt were th said to have invented chemistry. All right? Or at least brought it to the rest of the world down in historical times. So it was called alchemy. And, which al and alchemy is just sort of, you might call it, the mystical phase of chemistry. The alchemists knew how to uh, find the invisible properties uh, inherent in substances and elements and chemicals. And yes, they were able to turn, they had the, some of them, not all of them, but some of them learned how to turn lead into gold. And yes. that do with Thoth, right? Yeah, well, always, yeah, Thoth, you can always, everything in some sense comes back to Thoth or Jehudi, the master of wisdom, science, knowledge, he was also the messenger, represented in two ways, um, as an ibis, and I've already mentioned this before, and also as a baboon. I, I don't, yeah. uh, you know what? Give that example. Yeah, every I always, time. every time. In ancient Egypt, if you call somebody an ape, it would not be an insult. That's like calling somebody Thoth or Jehudi. Because, you know, he was a sacred, he was sacred to Thoth, the, the, uh, the baboon. Now, if I went out in the street or went out and started calling somebody an ape or a baboon, he'd want to fight. Here. Shows you how disconnected we have become from ancient archetypes, shall we say. All right. But anyway, um, now, the, the astronomy and the astrology, the, you know, everything in the world is dictated because we're part of that, those heavenly movements, you know. We're part of that. And they, they impact us, and we have lost it. So that astrology just becomes, what would you say? People just think it's, uh, there's a word I'm looking for. Uh, you know, people superstition. Just, yeah, it's, yeah, 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 superstition, just something you read about in a newspaper, has no scientific validity at all. But again, it depends on, if you have a narrow definition of what science is, yeah, well then, it doesn't touch you. That means most of what is true doesn't touch you. But science, science here just means knowledge, to know, all knowledge. So um, we, we, are, we are part of a universe. I mean, we really are part of a universe. An extension of it, it manifests through us. In ancient Kemet, they, they not only knew it, they, they, they spent not only years, but centuries and millennia studying it and systematizing it, okay, and writing about it. That's, oh, that's the reason why they carved so many things on walls. You know, yeah, they're papyri. They, they wrote them in papyri, but they carved it on the walls. Why? Papyri are what? perishable. Those things are still on the walls. Mm. You know, uh, if those of you in the audience out there watching, I, I, I uh, commend you to do one thing in your life if you don't do anything. Take that one trip to Kemet. Do that. Mm -hmm. You know, call it your pilgrimage. Uh, you, 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 won't, you won't ever look at things the same. You can't. You can't go there and not be, and it doesn't matter who's there now. People say, well, it's just Arabs there now. That's, but th that, that may be as it may be, but there, there is something in Kemet that 
that is timeless, and you can still feel it. You know, my friend, as I said, my friend Anthony Karakamoon Browder, he is, he is one of the co-directors of an um, a excavation of a 25th dynasty, that is the so-called Nubian dynasty, um, tomb of Karakamoon, that's why we call him Karakamoon, who was a chief, uh, he was a chief priest in, uh, of the 25th dynasty. And so I visited there a couple of times. One time I was walking back to the bus across a barren ground, and I stopped right where I was. I said, hmm, if I dug... 20 feet on the ground, right here where I'm standing, I'd find artifacts, monuments, might even find temple, cities. People don't even realize what's buried beneath the sands of modern Egypt. No concept. And Nubian too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, we haven't even talked about Nubian Kush because no. the ancient Egyptian says that's where Egypt came from. People like to think of Nubia or Kush as a second-rate Egypt. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. There are one, one million mounds in what we call Kush, which is now the northern Sudan, that have never been touched by the hand of spade, of, us, of archaeological spade. They won't touch it. <laughs> because <Why? laughs> Because if they, what they're going to find there just will turn the, the, the conventional sense of history upside down on its head. I'm sorry it all comes from there. All of he's it. Sorry, he's sorry. <laughs> everything that you have in America and Europe, everything comes from there. And that's just a fact. Yeah. I'm sorry if that, whoever that may be offended by that, but it's, I'm afraid it's the truth. And yeah. you know what? The Egyptologists know it. That's why they, yeah, don't, they, 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 they don't let you know everything. Do you know that where the nose of the Sphinx is? Mm. The one that got blown off by Napoleon? <laughs> Okay, so one of, it? it's in the it's, it's actually in the basement of the Cairo Museum. I didn't know that. I thought it, it was it, just it, gone. It's not just gone. No. Jeez, if there was robbing us of our <laughs> if, they, if they were if they were <sighs> able to attach that nose back to the Sphinx, now I'm going to use this term because I'm going to use it advisedly. It would be the face of what we used to call a Negro. Gosh. Yes. I'm okay. sorry. Well, it was called the Black Land. Black Land. Okay, there you go. Yeah. And Kemiu meant black people. That was the, yeah. the Black Land was Kemet, the people of Kemiu, or the black people. Yeah. Well, oh my gosh, we're always out of time. Just yeah, as we I did, get I didn't. We, we didn't even <laughs> talk about half the things no, we, we were supposed it. to talk we about. We did it. We did it. But that's good because we have more material for our future webinars, for more Facebook lives. If you guys like this, please don't hesitate to let us know because you know we're here for you. We're also here to help. Um, spread the knowledge that Dr. Finch has for all of us, um, what he can do for us as a people, for, our, for the children, is unbelievable. The, the amount of information that we can get from him and the, just rediscovering ourselves, um, having pride in ourselves, way more than, than just what Black Panther was able to do on, on a grander <laughs> scale. People like my dad and my dad, he's one of the last of his kind. Most of the people, the great... Um, um, scholars of the, of the period that, that brought us this information. A lot of them are not with us anymore, and my dad still is, thank God. So, you know, you're listening to um, a legend. Um, and we just hope that, we're, we're just glad that you guys are here. We hope that you will share this. Um, you know, sometimes people don't like what he has to say, but some of you guys, a lot of you guys do. So that's why we keep going and we will never stop believing in bringing this history, our African roots and our African history and spreading that. Um, again, I know my dad spends a lot of time on Egypt. Please forgive him. That is his area of expertise, but he also knows so much about African history West as Africa, well. West Africa. West African particular. history and um, just the Nile Valley, Valley yeah. in general. But he doesn't know necessarily all African history, but those are his areas of expertise that he has spent 20 to 30 years studying, painstakingly studying and writing books on and um, studying with um, the world's leading, um, or uh, studying under the world's leading um, experts on that. So um, let me just say this uh, before we finish. I, I, I don't know whether I've said this in previous uh, late Facebook lives or not. Take that area from the Senegal River in the north to the Congo River in the south, that stretch of West Africa. All of the major ethnic groups, without exception, can trace their origins back to ancient Egypt. Absolutely. They began those uh, migrations, I think I have mentioned this, back yeah, about 660 our... B.C. The last ones to leave were the Dogon, 
they're the ones still that really kind of clung more, more, what's the word, more conscientiously to the ancient Egyptian forms. But all of them, whether the Yoruba, the, the Akana, the Ashanti, mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh, Fon, the yeah. Ewe, the, uh, the Lebu, yeah. all of them came from Egypt. And consequent, we, a lot of us over here in America, can um, trace our roots back to them as well. I don't know if you guys done your Ancestry.com, but we have our roots a lot in Benin and Nigeria, the Yoruba, um, the Senegambia area, uh, have, Cameroon. A lot of us can trace our roots back there. So have, in, the, in some sense, we can ultimately trace our roots back to the Nile Valley as well. So definitely have some pride in that. Again, um, we do have to close it out because, you know, uh, everybody's got to get back to their lives. And, um, Thank you again for watching. Um, if you have any questions, um, want to contact Dr. Finch directly, Charles S. Finch at gmail.com. Gmail Someone mentioned they were in the store, they had a, a issue checking out. We will definitely get on that um, as soon as possible. But um, visit, the website has more than just this store, but um, also he has a YouTube channel, Charles S. Finch. Um, on YouTube and we're gonna continue to do these hopefully every week um, these brief Facebook lives just little chats if you will and we'll also do webinars so that um, my dad can reap some of the um, rewards back from um, exerting all, all his you know the energy and, and giving you guys and sharing with you guys so so much knowledge so thank you for your support thank you for your time and we will see you next week. Sometimes we do Tuesdays and Wednesdays. We can't always um, get the exact time. But we'll try to do, we're trying to, gonna try to stick with uh, Tuesdays. Try to, we're gonna try to do Tuesdays, but uh, as Rabia said, it's not always uh, convenient to do Sometimes we have to do Wednesdays. Yeah, sometimes we so, have to do Wednesdays. And, but it will almost always be at seven o'clock. So just kind of look out for, we make an announcement the morning of. And if you like that, please stay tuned for next week. All right, thank you guys so much.